everybody. How's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So Thomas Carlyle is a really interesting author. He's someone that has fallen off the radar for a lot of people. He used to be somebody who was spoken of in the English canon as kind of one of the greatest authors, often put along side people like Shakespeare and, and was understood as someone that was necessary for a lot of people to read. Many of his political viewpoints haven't aged so well historically for those who believe in kind of the progressive Whig view of history. And so in many ways, he has been canceled or really more just disappeared out of kind of common knowledge, also because he's a little difficult to read. And so people often don't talk about him, but he does have a huge impact on the way that we understand things, very specifically history. If you don't know Thomas Carlyle, you probably still know about the great man theory of history. It's one that often comes up for debate when you get into a history class. And that theory comes out of the book that we're going to be discussing today on heroes and hero worship. So joining me today to talk about Thomas Carlyle, hero worship, history, and a whole bunch of other stuff is one of my favorites, Jay Burden. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back on, Aaron. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. When's the first time you kind of uh, interacted with Carlisle? Because I have to be honest, I did not read any Carlisle until I started reading Curtis Yarvin, who spoke of him so highly. Well, that that's certainly my first contact with him as well. And I got to him through through two reasons. One, obviously, is Moldbug. He pulls a lot from Carlisle. And so, you know, even if you you absolutely disagree with everything Moldbug has ever written, he pr he provides one of the best reading lists in our circles. And so you have, you have to give him that, if nothing else. And the other one is a book from uh, another obscure right-wing figure, Jonathan Bowden. And he had a book called Pulp Fascism, which is a book, maybe a discussion for another day. But he does something very similar where he goes through different heroic figures and, and speaks about what they tell us about society. Now, Bowden is focused more on pop culture, as you can imagine from the title of the book. Uh, but he goes through specifically uh, a character you may be familiar with, Solomon Cain. And when he talks about this sort of austere, you know, witch hunting Puritan, he references Thomas Carlyle in that essay. And so between the two of those, it's like, okay, well, I like both of these guys. I better check it out. And, and Thomas Carlyle is really one of the greats in the Western canon. It, you're, you're very much right. He was considered one of the all-time greats. He was, uh, he was very, very popular in the Victorian era. Uh, Dickens was sort of an acolyte of Thomas Carlyle. He infamously carried around his books wherever he went. But due, for, due to a number of reasons, which we'll probably you know, get into, he's very much fallen out of fashion. Uh, and because of that, he's sort of been erased from the canon. His, he's very influential on the way that we speak in somewhat similar way that Shakespeare is. So even that term, the great man theory of history, it derives from Carlyle. He also, he also came up with that phrase you may have heard to describe economics, the dismal science. So even if you don't know Carlisle, you know Carlisle is, is a good way to describe it. Right. Yeah, I want to dive into that because like you said, he's, he's somebody who has a large impact, though a lot of people probably can't directly reference him. I certainly didn't run into him in any kind of public school setting. You weren't reading excerpts of Carlisle or in any of his work the way that you would someone like Shakespeare or Dante or somebody. And so uh, it's somebody who's had a large impact, but has been largely erased from uh, kind of the average American or even Westerners understanding of literature and culture. So, guys, we're going to dive into uh, on heroes and hero worship. But before we do, let's hear from New Founding. Hey, guys, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, New Founding Talent. Look, we all know that the job market is a disaster right now based people can't find good companies to work for, and good companies can't find anybody to get the job done. The competency crisis is very, very real. So how do we get these two incredibly important groups together? We need organizations like New Founding. New Founding has created a network of high-excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are already using this network to hire high-trust, exceptional individuals who can match the culture and mission 
of their teams. So if you're looking for better employees to build a better world, you need to go ahead and apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with candidates who will build your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. Check it out today. All right. So uh, this book is really interesting because Carlisle is primarily an essayist. In fact, many of his books are simply an assembling of different essays that he wrote. And so there's a feel to this for sure. It's a collection of six different lectures that he gave. And the notes of those lectures get turned into one book. He gives each of these six lectures on different archetypes of what the hero is and then give specific examples of the people before we get into the content of this book where do you put it in carlisle's uh kind of kind of canon because i would say this probably is the best place for people to start due to the structure of it i would say a smaller chunk of reading something like chartism might be the best because that's also maybe a more politically applicable work as where this one rambles quite a bit in many different directions as Carlisle always does, but, but probably uh, something slightly more focused, I think would be easier, even though this is an important work to be sure. Certainly. I think that you're, you're right. That it's probably best to start with a a bite-sized chunk of Carlisle. I I will say because it is sort of six self-contained lectures it is not something you need to sit through in one go and read it through it lends itself to you know, sort of the lecture format. And because of that, if you can find an audiobook, it actually translates quite well to that. It was given as a talk. Obviously, I have a hard copy. I reference it quite often. If you've ever uh, read or listened to my work, it's effectively a bingo. Like one of the spaces on the bingo card is references Carlisle, right? Uh, but nonetheless, I think Chartism is a very good place to start with that. There are several collections of Carlisle's work. I can't remember the name of any of them off the top of my head, which is horrible podcasting. But uh, he's not hard to find. And if you're interested in used books, because he was so popular in a a previous era and has now fallen from that, it is quite easy to get very nice leather bound copies of Carlisle for penny on the dollar. Uh, So I'd recommend that if you're a a physical book collector. Yeah, sadly, one one year, my wife, I mean, happily for me, but sadly for public education, one year my wife surprised me with a, a large collection of leather bound Thomas Carlisle books that had just been pulled from a library somewhere. They still had the uh, the library cards in the pockets, uh, you know, uh, on the inside of the books, probably banned by some, you know, angry librarian who couldn't believe that this reactionary bigot was still sitting on their uh, university uh, library shelves somewhere, uh, but uh, got it very cheaply due to exactly what you're saying there. So definitely. And to frame this work, I think it's important to... To, to reference what we mean when we're talking about the right and the left. You know, the, the sort of raison d'etre, the end goal of the left is equality. And the reason that Thomas Carlyle is so popular among right-wingers and reactionaries is that is 180 degrees the opposite of what Carlyle sees as being the true, the just, and the beautiful. And his whole concept of the great man of history is very much related to political elite theory, right? Which is something, Aaron, that you and I talk about all the time. And that's the idea that history is shaped by these great men who sort of uproot the the pre-existing order through their their will. And so what he does is this is first sort of lay out his thesis statement, right? That, That these great men really are what make the course of history. And then through that examines a specific archetype of the hero. So he starts with Odin, right? The hero as a god. Then he moves to Muhammad, right? The got the hero as a prophet. And although Thomas Carlyle is at least nominally Christian, he goes through characters and and heroes from other cultures, specifically to show one, this is a universal human institution, right? That of hero worship. And also, and he says this multiple times, it's much easier to talk about the prophet Muhammad than it is to talk about a specific biblical prophet. You know, people will get their hackles up. Uh, And so that's something I would say, you know, if you're interested in reading this book, don't be put off by that. He knows exactly what he's doing. And so when he talks about Muhammad, he talks about Thor or Odin. He's not believing in those guys, right? He is not a Muslim. He is not a Norse pagan, but is using that as as a prism to examine hero worship. And so if you've heard anything about this book, you've probably heard that phrase, 
hero worship is the basis of civilization. And what he means in that is that not only do great men determine the course of, of societies and of cultures, but also that the civic religion, right, the, the moral framework of any society is in many ways determined by the men they put forth as laudable and notable, right, put forth as something to be imitated. And so, for instance, you see that in the American context. We're sort of on our fourth American republic, right? But within each one of those different sort of dispensations of America, you see a great man who sort of sets that forth. So obviously you have Washington, then you have Andrew Jackson, you know, then you have uh, Abraham Lincoln, and then FDR. And each one of those men is sort of turning over the pre-existing institution, creating something new, and albeit it's contiguous. And then after that, people look to them as the model to imitate. And I think it's very important as you know, someone who is, shall we say, less than thrilled with the current, ex the current state our society is in, to look back at heroes from our tradition and say, I want to be like that. If you look at a man like Robert E. Lee, for instance, and he viewed himself in relation to Washington. He felt like he needed to live up to that. And so that's really what Carlisle is getting at and why this book is so important for us as students of history and lovers of tradition. Yeah, you're right to point out that he's really taking many, many figures that people wouldn't assume he would use because he's trying to establish the universality of, uh, of this phenomenon, that even though the type of people that each civilization will venerate will change due to the character of the people, the fact that they will be defined by who they venerate is always the case and so he often pulls again like you said examples like odin or muhammad which he would not personally believe in but he also pulls people like maybe uh luther i mean he is he is kind of a you know he's a protestant to the extent that he's a christian so maybe luther would be somebody that he would actually venerate but he also pulls people uh like uh rousseau uh when he talks about the hero as king he pulls not ancient kings, but he goes ahead and highlights people like Cromwell and Napoleon. And so these are often people that you would think an arch reactionary would, would probably not invest in. These, these, are, these are not like the Plutarch's lives that he would want people to emulate. But, this, but at the same time, he's still willing to look at these people because he's trying to show this phenomenon. And, and really his core thing that he tries to, to tell people is that it's about being men of action. Each one of these are men who are great. Each one of these are ones that excel and lead. And he often seems to, to say, we almost cannot judge men who are like this because they are kind of beyond what the average person is capable of, what they understand. And who are we to kind of you know foist our, our lower moral understanding on some of these uh, kind of... Uh, genre defining men these archetypal men uh it's interesting again it's not it's not the kind of people that you would think you know you would mention as an arch uh, reactionary for hero worship but he often seems to pull from uh some of those places we wouldn't expect just, just to show how central this concept is definitely and one of the things that we we need to we need to address with this concept of great men is that great men and good men are not necessarily synonymous Right? Like you look at someone like Genghis Khan, he's certainly a great man. He changed the course of history. He's not exactly a nice guy, right? Those are almost often a, a completely like negative correlation. And I think it's it's this sort of thing is important because I think we are witnessing the birth of a new civic religion. And so our old American heroes are being forcefully removed. And that matters. And it doesn't just matter because I like old statues. I certainly do. But because the figures that the state puts forward as admirable, right, as its symbols, matter quite a bit. And they matter for that version of virtue, right? That determines what virtue is, at least in a civic sense. And so when you look at a, at a culture like ours, right, that is very interested in destroying the symbols of the old order and replacing them with either completely fake people or these kind of like, you know, horrible criminals, right, who are kind of raised the status of secular saints. This is why this matters, right? Because th this is what makes up a civilization. And when you see those heroes change, it's a leading indicator that the rest of the civilization are, is following in their way, so to speak. 
Yeah, you really notice, like you said, it, it does not escape the left, even though they don't believe to some extent in this, it does not escape the left that that which we venerate, the, the heroes that we worship will define society. And so because they're looking to flatten things out, because they're looking for equality, it seems so often that the key is removing those who have m taken great actions, those who have actually built things, discovered things, founded things. And instead, it's increasingly about replacing them with those that flatten things out, those that uh, created some kind of equity. Though it was the first you know, person of these nine traits to achieve something that had already been achieved several times over. Nothing can be new. Nothing can be uh, be truly built and inspiring. Instead, it's simply the, the remix and rehashing until all of our heroic figures kind of melt down into that gray goo of no, no one who stands out and elevates the human character or sparks the imagination. Only those that can kind of retread the same ground we've been over several times, but with a new different hue or set of genitalia. Well, and that's exactly why I opened this discussion by talking about the difference between the right and the left, right? Because the left, their primary end goal is, is that flattening, right? It, it is full and total equality. And in Carlisle, we see something very different that there is a difference between men. And, you know, he mentions there are multiple ways to be great, right? The, these heroes share certain traits, but there are also different archetypes. But in the beginning, you know, in the start of his section on Odin, when he's, he's sort of introducing this, this series, he talks about the, the fact that, you know, virtue is very much striving to be like these men. And, and we've kind of talked about the fact that, well, Carlyle had, shall we say, a complicated relationship with, with Christianity, he does nonetheless point to Christ as the supreme example of right, right? One who is fully God and fully man. And so what he says is that each of these heroes sort of has a, a spark of divinity in them, right? They are more than simply a human. And obviously, I don't mean that in the literal sense, right? They all, they all died. But nonetheless, there is something in them that is, that is transcendent of the normal order. And this is something that even men well before Carlyle spoke about. You know, if you read, uh, if you read the class, the Greek classics, right, you you you'll know that there is a different word for these heroes. They're not simply anthropoi, right? There's man. They're viewed as more than that, and because of that, right, there's this idea that you know there's there is a quality difference between these two groups, and I don't mean that in a moral sense, right? Obviously, you know, we, we could have a theological discussion there, but in the sense that if you cannot recognize that some men are greater than others you've sort of already swallowed that poison pill of equality. And it's just, you are sort of negotiating where on the slippery slope you'll set up your shop, so to speak. So this is an interesting, I think, uh, crossroads for Christians who are studying this because I think a lot, especially modern Christians would worry about the phrase hero worship, right? We're talking about ide ideol or idolatry. We're talking about elevating a man to the place of a God, of course, we know if you if you look at most cla uh, classical heroes from antiquity, at some point, uh, these people are elevated to somehow have had a relationship with the gods, right? Either they're the they're actually secretly the son of God. At some point, Zeus like snuck down and you know slept with their mother, and they're actually descended from from a god. At some point, if if you are going to become a truly powerful ruler, an Alexander or a uh, a Julius Caesar, at some point, someone would need to introduce. The idea that that you were physically descended, or you know, you're genealogically descended uh, from a god at some point. Obviously, that's not something that uh, modern people would be comfortable with in general. But specifically for Christians, there's a religious injunction to kind of avoid that. And so, is is there a way that Christians can view this uh, without perhaps falling back on the more ancient understandings of direct lineage to to gods or the elevation and idolatry of of a man? Definitely. And I take your I take your point to heart, right? And so when we use this phrase hero worship, obviously some of these figures, you know, in Carlyle's work were literally worshipped as gods. And and we can reject that, right? We obviously we're, we're monotheistic. We believe that there is, you know, one God. And at the same time, we can look at men who were greater than us, right? And and I, in addition to kind of the, the great men of history, have people that I strive to emulate. And Obviously, the term worship has a certain connotation that we can we can disagree with. But the point is, right, it is looking at someone as an example to follow. 
obviously the, the the church understands this well. You know, I am not Catholic, but there's this idea of Christian saints, right? Someone who has lived the Christian life well. And so you are, you are in many cases, being named after someone and the idea that you will follow forth in their footsteps. And, you know, when we use that term worship, it is sort of a, a directing of attention towards, right? So in, in the in the Christian world, there's this idea that, you know, if you, if you misorder your affections, you misorder your attention, it is a form of idolatry. And so certainly you can take hero worship, right? The striving to imitate a human too far. Now, I will say, when I look around at, at society, I don't see that error being committed very often, right? I don't see many people who live in, you know, the cult of Oliver Cromwell. I'm sure there's someone out there who does that. But to me, the problem of modernity is very much a problem of deconstruction. It's that we can't view these men sincerely. We have to view them as, you know, somehow compromised, as somehow worse than the narrative, right? The idea that if it is a story, we must pull it apart and deconstruct it. And so while there certainly is an error there, it is not the error we are oftentimes faced. And so, again, there's an idea of the Aristotelian golden mean here. You know, there is certainly excesses on both sides. But given the situation we're in, I don't see that as being a particularly pressing concern. If you see what my if you see what I'm getting at. I do. And I think it's essential for people. You know, it's very easy for someone to say, well, just emulate Christ. And of course, you should like that. That's that that is great advice. Uh, to a large extent. However, there is, I think, an important step between, you know, people need, uh, some, sometimes they need that with skin on. And so I think for the average Christian, you know, the, the emulation of one's father or mother, depending on, you know, which, which role you embody is, is a perfect example of that. We, you, you should be able to do that. That should be something that is a, is a well-ordered understanding of the family without, deifying anyone without creating idolatry or, or or crossing that line and if we can do that with our parents then we can we can ex extrapolate that out to larger uh you know tribe and then civilization because what are those things except the continuation of the family and so i think that there there is an easy way to understand this as you said without going overboard i want to i want to get over into who we are emulating because you you touched on that there and i think that's important. It's not just that we're not emulating anyone. I think that we have to emulate someone. Um, and, and we've deconstructed all those that are worth emulating and instead are, are patting our pattern, patterning our behavior on those that most certainly don't deserve it. But before we get into that, guys, let me tell you very quickly about ISI. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education. They're actively undermining it. And we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference. Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to ISI.org. That's ISI.org. So like you were saying, Jay, it, obviously one of the big lines from this book is that hero worship is the core of civilization, right? And what he's talking about there is that the things that we continue to pattern, pattern ourselves after are what defines our way of being, right? That, that's how we create a people. That's how a people are created, is that they, they see a line of people who continually pattern themselves off of similar ideas 
And that is what makes their way of being different from someone else. That makes their culture distinct. This is why the American culture can be distinct from French culture, which can be distinct from, you know, uh, Indian culture or Chinese culture. There are great men. There are people to inhabit. There are patterns of being to inhabit that come from heroes in each of those traditions. And that is what really creates a distinct civilization. All of them have those great men. It's not, it's not that, you know, one is even necessarily greater than another, but it is that the, those people set the pattern, the, the, the chain of being that will be carried down from that heroic uh, pattern through father and son, through mother and daughter into uh, kind of your daily life. And, and that's what defines you. As you're saying, we do a lot of deconstruction today. It's become extremely important for the left to deconstruct all of these patterns and all of these ways of being. And it's created an incredibly cynical culture, of course. What's left of our culture is is, uh, kind of this this cynical uh, miasma. However, I think we are still seeing people desperately attempt this emulation. It's just now it's you know, Kardashians or, or rappers or something instead of, you know, uh, world historical figures or poets, you know, uh, preachers, kings. And this is this is what has made us who we are. It's not that we've stopped emulating because we can't. We will we will emulate someone. These, these archetypes will exist. It's just that we've de- deconstructed all of those that were worth uh, something that that bound us to our tradition and instead have left people to you know emulate the the kind of guys who do burger king commercials well right and this is why carlisle is able to pull from so many different cultures because this is a universal human institution and so you know really this whole project of unlimited emancipation must ultimately fail right because it is based in a lie it is based in this idea that you know you can just sort of manage the things you don't like about human nature out of existence. But that doesn't mean that that project, right, that great social engineering scheme, can't do a lot of harm. And so what I think you're seeing with, and another great example is the extreme rise to prominence of, of sports, right, which look, and I like sports as much as the next guy, is that the traditional way people, you know, kind of like index themselves to heroes has been destroyed. And so, you know, this is a part of human nature. People are always looking for this. And so they find these kind of like ersatz, you know, replacement versions for that, for that same thing. And I, I think that your, your point about celebrity is something, you know, important to, to talk about. Because, you know, obviously there have always been famous people, but the idea of, you know, the celebrity in that sense is a relatively modern one. Now, some of that just has to do with, technology, right? Like it's difficult to be an international music sensation when you can't record your music. But nonetheless, I think that it, again, speaks to the kind of fraying nature of social fabric. And one of the other things that's interesting in this is you see, you know, like you mentioned that, you know, your heroes sort of define what your culture is, is that America is fractioning into, from a certain level, dozens of subcultures. And that's been going on for longer than both of us have been alive. But also on the on the national political scale, right? We cannot agree on a common cast of characters. And I've spoken with with Kryptos before, who's a you know very like a very wise man, about this problem with a lack of sort of shared authority, right? That we cannot agree on where legitimacy comes from. And you know certainly some of that is governmental and political, but there's another part of that which is what is the heroic? What is a good man. Now, it's especially difficult when you say, what is a good man? And one side says, well, who are you to say what is good? And who are you to say what a man is? But nonetheless, right, it does sort of point to, it does sort of point to this fracture. And so what I think will happen, and I I feel pretty confident in this, is that all these sort of like ersatz fake heroes, you know, that either have been created by media or created by the political class will fade away, right? There's nothing, there's no there there, you know, to use kind of a, a stupid phrase for it. But nonetheless, the amount of deconstruction is harming that chain of being. And so, you know, when, when you when you speak about something like that insincerity, right, that desire, desire to deconstruct, 
I think it's hard because as postmoderns, it's kind of built into your brain, no matter what. It's very difficult to get that out of your mind. But I think that, you know, when, when we're faced with this kind of crisis of civic religion, right, faced with this crisis of belief, to go back to something real, to go back to heroes who aren't fake, who sort of arose naturally and were remembered naturally. One of the canards you hear from the left, right, whenever you talk about hierarchy, is this idea that, oh, if you believe in hierarchy, if you believe in, you know, kind of a, a rank ordering of, of traits, that you think you would be at the top. You know, like, oh, you just do, you just want that because you're mad that you're not successful. And that's something that Carlyle has no truck with. You know, he basically says that the foundation of piety, right, is this idea that there is something greater than myself and I owe it reverence. And obviously, you know, like we said, you don't owe the same reverence to a to a hero that you owe to God, right? You don't owe the same reverence to a king, to your father, to any one of these things. But they are mirror images of each other. And if you can't show proper reverence in one area of your life, it's very unlikely you can show it in others. It is a virtue that must be cultivated. And you know, Lewis made this point, and I'm stealing this from chat, so it's not a particularly original idea, that... You know, in order to make good Christians, you must first make good pagans, right? And what he meant by that is you have to instill virtues. And one of those virtues is piety, right? It is respect for things that ought to be respected, if you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, there's a really interesting, I'm glad you brought that up because I saw, I saw someone post about that on Twitter. They said something to the effect of, all these people should be careful. I, I don't understand why... People want to want to talk about elevating beauty when they themselves are not very beautiful people. And I'm like, that is the most sick, twisted, modern understanding of the good. Oh, well, I, I would only want good things elevated if they benefit me. If I can't materially understand the way that this changes my condition in a positive way, then I don't want good or true or beautiful things to be on display because maybe I'm not good and I'm not beautiful. And I'm not true in some ways. And so therefore, the elevation of those things would you know, would, would make me worse off. And it's like, wow, that is if there is a way to kind of distill the leftist way, uh, you know, mindset, that is it. Like that is I I would rather the world be a worse place where I am equal to everyone being garbage or maybe even elevated above others because I am garbage. Then have a well-ordered world where the good, the beautiful, and the truthful are on, the good, the beautiful, and the true are on top, and that means that I might be convicted by the fact that I don't measure up to those things. And you're absolutely right. Like if you are not beautiful, if you are not good, if you are not virtuous, then that is not a reason to tear those things down. That is a reason for you to be convicted to be better as much as you can and revere those that have achieved. But again, like you said, that that is its own virtue because that requires you to to have a certain level of humility and to say, no, others should be ordered above me at some at some point there. The, even if you even if I am someone who could achieve good or great things at some level, I must recognize that there are those that can do more and will do more and deserve to be elevated above me before because of that fact. And that is such an anathema to the to the progressive ideas that have just melted our society down that even uttering that sounds like heresy to most people but it's like well what is the uh, is the other option we're living in it and it's terrible well i think that that's the root of many of my gripes with the modern ruling class right like if i'm perfectly honest in no time am i a harvard graduate right i, I accept that but when I look at people who are, right, who have been given the stamp of approval as the best and brightest in society, and you look at them and you're like, you're a moron. You have no ideas whatsoever. You, you sort of realize that something is, is, is very wrong. Because I think that, you know, many of us, if we looked at our rulers, looked at our elite, and saw men who were wise and august, who were, who were better than us, there's something natural in that, right? Like there is a natural social hierarchy. And obviously, it's never perfect. There are always incompetent fools. There are always you know, people who got there by nepotism. But when that becomes the rule, not the exception, you, know, you see this sort of lack of faith. You, know, you see a lack of legitimacy. 
And that's one of the interesting things about our elites and their, their political formula, right, to, to borrow a term from Moscow, is that, you know, every political formula is at a certain level based in a faith claim, right? It's very easy to point this out in the, in the ancient cultures, right? The son is my dad, therefore I'm king, right? Not literally true, but it's, it's, an, it's a justification for why that, that person is in charge. And our elites have their own. But the problem is when you lose that respect, you lose the mandate of heaven, as the Chinese would say, you lose all legitimacy. And, and there's this idea of moving from being a, a creative minority, right? An elite that has exceptional traits to a merely dominant one, where you effectively are just in charge because your, your predecessors were. And obviously when that happens, you know, you've lost that, that greatness. There's really only two ways. Either a new great man and his friends come about, you know, you can look at someone like FDR, right, who completely overturned the existing order, or that order goes away and nothing replaces it, at least in the in the contiguous sense. And so, you know, when we look at our leaders, we look at our elite and see a lack of those great virtues, you've got to understand that that matters more than just calling them names, right? You need that to rule both from the perspective of just making the machine of government work, right? That's a hard thing to do, but also because that is required for political legitimacy, no matter what the, the general government structure is. Well, and I think what, what's really interesting also is the focus that Carlisle puts on the kind of man this is, that these are men who act, right? That these are, these are men who are forces in the world. The he specifically uh, chides those who would go around and just like Hector, the small moral imperfections of these men. Oh, well, you know, as you, as you said at the beginning, often great men are not good men. And they're, they're if we were to sit there and measure them with the, the average moral rural ruler of, uh, of kind of, kind of the way they live their lives, they would come short in many ways that have foibles. They would make mistakes. And a lot of times people will take those things and say, well, and because I didn't do this, because I didn't you know, engage in this sin or the, this moral flaw, therefore I am better than this great man. And we see this, of course, today, mo most routinely with, with the idea of racism, right? Or sexism, because this guy owned a slave or this guy said that, you know, there are differences between different peoples or di different genders and things that means that therefore it doesn't matter if they manage to like, conquer a continent or uh, found an entire country or, you know, build a, a, a massive civilization or revolutionize uh, the way that we understand some scientific venture. Uh, they, they had, they engaged in some wrong, wrong thing, right? We can literally see this with DNA when it, when it comes uh, to Watson. And so, uh, it's very common today that we look at someone who's achieved something great and we say, well, because they committed the one unforgivable sin in the modern day, therefore everything this person did is, is suddenly irrelevant. Or we have to go back and retroactively make someone, you know, uh, a different race or a different uh, sexual proclivity so they can once again be elevated because otherwise they, they would not belong into the pantheon. They need one of these more deified characteristics. And this is a way of pulling down men of action say, and, and it's something that small people do to try to make themselves feel better about the fact that they are not someone who, who did this, but these actions are essential for Carlisle. It, it's not about whether this man is perfect or even if this man is, is necessarily moral, but it's the, their ability to act. And I think that's interesting because many people, including, you know, guys like De Maestra and Schmidt and others really emphasize this fact, the, the ability to make decisions, to exercise sovereignty, to act in the moment. And this is something that we are just terrified of, right? Like our entire government, our entire moral system, our entire way of thinking is to remove this like executive great man impulse in all aspects of life, uh, be it science or, or, or everything or, or, you know, politics or anything. And that is what is most necessary to Carlisle to define a great man. And that, that's a, a very prescient point. And you, one of the things that I will get frustrated with conservatives for, and I don't mean this in a punitive way, right? Conservatives are my people. I want them to win. This is why I bring this up. But I get frustrated is that they grant the left moral legitimacy, right? They, they, they assent 
to the premises of the lab. And one of the things that I think is important to look at is what are they replacing these men with? Are they replacing them with better men? Like, okay, fair enough, I guess, hypothetically. But no, they're replacing them with small men. With men, okay, maybe not necessarily entirely. But they're replacing them with, with very cheap, kind of fake, low-rent virtues. Like being, being generally pleasant, right? Having certain innate characteristics. And, you know, the idea that, you know, being born a certain way is on the same level as, for instance, you know, settling a whole new area, you know, creating a people, you know, uh, winning a battle. It's just on its face, totally ridiculous. And so one of the things I, I sort of want to charge conservatives with is, is don't stand for this. Don't give them the moral legitimacy, because if you do, you, they've already won. You know, you've given them the, the, the moral and, and sort of the spiritual upper hand. And I think that that is, you know, maybe it, we can take that in a way that isn't the most topical, but nonetheless, right, when we're looking at the, the deconstruction of Western culture more broadly, but also of American culture, it's important to realize that they're not doing that because they, you know, sincerely care about, you know, making sure that, you know, the, that our, our history books are accurate. They're doing it because they hate the virtues those men stand for. They have another set of virtues that are completely contrary to any good and decent human governance. And so, again, that's something to be aware of, because oftentimes, you know, this deconstruction is cloaked in the language of historical accuracy. You know, like, oh, well, you know, we, we have to be we have to be, you know, very, uh, very considerate, you know, when we talk about these men. But really, when you look at it, it's effectively revenge of the nerds. You know, it's like, I don't like the cool jock who did something cool. We're going to replace it with someone like me, someone who doesn't make me feel bad, who doesn't have virtues dramatically greater than my own. And again, I just feel like it speaks to the the intellectual and moral poverty of this whole system of belief. Yeah, it's you know, it's it frustrates me sometimes because of course I talk to a lot of people in dissident rights circles and a lot of us are obviously talking heads, you know, doing doing internet scholarship. And they'll say things like, well, you know, everybody in the military is just a sheep and how could they go and fight and die for the, for the regime? And, and look, at, at some extent, I understand, like at this point, I would not advise people to go into the military because it, they're the people running it hate you. But they will often try to denigrate the impulse, the people who would be men of action, who would be rough and ready, who would be fight because they themselves just simply would never engage in that behavior. And I tell them, like, look, guys. While you might not like the thing that they are currently willing to fight for, you need to understand that the impulse and the ability to do these great things is noble. And just because they don't have a, a noble outlet to, to you know, put that forward for does not you, you are not better than these people. I wrote down a, um, a quote from Carlisle because I thought it was so great. He says, uh, a man lives by being something, not by debating and arguing uh, many things. And, uh, you know, and to be clear, he's not just saying that it's only military men, right? A among his six archetypes uh, are the uh, hero as the men of letters, the hero as, uh, well, you know, the, the hero as the prophet, the hero as, as the poet. You know, these are not warriors in a physical sense, right? So he's not just saying, well, if you're not the guy who picks up the sword, then you can't be a great man. He clearly outlines at least half or more of his as of his archetypes as his hero archetypes as those that are not specifically combat oriented. But the act, but again, the action is key in each one of these. Is that these men were willing to forge ahead and create a world, um, and 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 be something and do something and not just talk about and debate something. So it's not just about uh, you know physical combat so much as it is about you know, making your stamp and, and being willing to, again, be that man of action when everyone else is busy trying to find ways and excuses to not put themselves out there and in those positions. And this is, this is very important because humans are, are fundamentally mimetic, right? We view ourselves in terms of, of narrative. And so when there, when there comes up something difficult that needs to be done, right? Something dangerous, something uncomfortable, whether that be you know, storming a machine gun nest 
or saying something that is very unpopular but necessary and true, people view themselves in terms of acting in a narrative sense, right? Acting like a hero. And, you know, when we look at something like the recruitment crisis, right, we see the fruits of that society where heroism has been deconstructed. You know, Oren, you, you and I both oftentimes reference this concept from Lewis of men without chests, right? That when you have, you have denied that sort of rank ordering of virtues, right? That there is a good and a bad way to act, act, right? That you can be judged by a standard outside yourself. You get something like Uvalde, right? You get a situation where you cannot motivate men to dangerous but necessary and virtuous action. And again, I, I used a Marshall example, but you know, Carlisle and, and you and I both understand, you know, there, there are other men who have who have similarly faced danger. But I think that, you know, one of the other consequences of this is that you will you will create men who are without heroic instincts. And I think that we live in the the consequences of that. You know, people like Daniel Penny, who did something, who did something dangerous, he is held out for ridicule. His his life is by many by many means ruined. You know, you look at someone like like Rittenhouse, right? And he very nearly was ruined. You know, he sort of got out of it by the skin of his teeth. And so if we're looking at trends, and I realize this is not a particularly optimistic thing to say, but that will continue because we have taken out that spark, right? We have taken out, at least on the broad cultural level, that that example, right? That meme, that story by which we are supposed to, to orient ourselves. So I think we would, uh, you know, we would be remiss if we did not stop to talk about the great man theory of history. Obviously, Carlisle never specifically formulates this. There's, there's no, the, uh, this is officially how I understand history or how history works, though he's certainly implying that through the, the, the through lines of the different uh, uh, essays here or the different lectures here. And Carlyle himself is a historian. He writes large, uh, you know, books on things like the French Revolution. So uh, among his many genres he writes in, history is most definitely one of them. Uh, but most people have construed from this book the idea of, of the great uh, the great man theory of history. And that's usually juxtaposed against the trends and forces uh, theory of history. And today... Uh, the the trends in theory, uh, uh, or you know, that's really where a lot of people put their stock, right? Is that th this is pe people are all because of the you know the economic modes of production and circumstances and these trends and forces. They're the things that actually drive history, and that great man history has in many ways fallen out of favor because again, everything has to not be the product of a great man. We're very terrified of great men. And so we need to strip them of their agency in every instance. It's always the trends and forces. It's never the, the actors there. Now I think this is a situation of obviously both, right? Like no man is completely made independent of the trends and forces that act upon him of his time and of his tradition. But many people are acted upon by trends and forces, and very few of them are great. And so this this is very obviously a, a both and and not an either or. But what do you think about the the great man theory of history and the emphasis that we've had uh, the 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 interest in shooting it down and and making sure that it's all trends and forces in today's education? I mean, I think like many things, it is presented as a neutral historical disagreement when in actuality that is an ideological conflict. Uh, you're hundred percent right. You know, and even you see this from Spangler, right? The idea that, you know, you were a man of your season, right? If you are a child of winter, right? Civilizational winter, that is the mode in which you exist. And it's, you can't really be, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a great man as you could in the summer of your civilization this winter, right? It's the wrong context for that. So there's certainly something to that. But I do think that, you know, if we accept the tenets of elite theory, right, that, you know, you were always ruled by a minority, no matter the system of government, that is just how humans organize themselves. I, I see the great man theory of history as an extension of that, right, that, that history is the history of the elites. And, and certainly trends and forces impact that, right? You know, for instance, right, that the world would be, would be very, very different if the Spanish government hadn't you know, bankrupted itself due to the broader economy, right? That's simply how things work. But at the same time, right, the idea that it's all just 
you know, kind of this, this huge, you know, black box, you know, just system where inputs and outputs are sort of, you know, controlled by so many people that it's impossible to identify any human agency. That's obviously not true. And again, I, I think that we have to see that as a spiritual and ideological claim, not a historical one in most cases. Uh, that's probably the best way to view it. Yep, I would agree. All right, guys. Well, uh, like I said, this is a great book. Of course, uh, you don't get an entire theory of history named after it for no reason. Uh, it is, it is oft, as is often the case with Carlyle, uh, a bit of a climb. If you're not familiar with his style, uh, it, it is a challenge for many, especially those who are unfamiliar. Uh, however, as uh, as Bert, Jay Burden said, it is in, in kind of bite-sized chunks because it is written as a series of lectures and so it's good thing you can you can kind of tackle one at a time chew on it come back to it and it's not like you really lost the through line or their narrative so it's a it's a good thing to kind of pick up a piece at a time think deeply on take some notes may, maybe reread it again and then go on to the next one and, you, and even if you do that you know over a series of months you won't have lost anything so it's it's not a terrible place to go ahead and and start diving into carlisle but but certainly worth your time and of course, uh, before we head over to the questions of the people, Mr. Burden, can you tell everyone where to find your excellent work? Sure. So my primary mode of output is the Jay Burden Show, creatively named, where I interview people you've heard of, like Aaron, like Lafayette Lee. I've got Kryptos on tonight, roughly three times a week. I also have a Substack that I have not engaged in much recently because I had nothing to say. Uh, and then a Twitter as well. If you're looking for something outside that I've done, I was recently on Andrew Clavin's show. So if you want to check me out there, you can. And again, Oron, thank you so much for having me on. I, I appreciate this greatly. Of course. And you did a great job on Clavin. That was that was well done. And also you just had uh, Daryl Cooper, Marner Made on. Uh, that's another great talk that people absolutely need to check out. All right. Uh, Creeper Weirdo says, uh, uh, does this go back uh, to who gets a statue? Yes, it really does. Everything does go back to who gets a statue? Uh, and uh, I, you know, I love one thing that I heard Carl Benjamin say a while back: uh, the right should just be building statues everywhere. The left is tearing down statues, uh, and the things it's putting up barely qualify as statues. They're all just these terrible, uh, amorphous blobs uh, that that everyone hates. Uh, the right should should be in the business of putting up uh, beautiful and wonderful statues, uh, just all over the place. Uh, because at the end of the day, that is a, a key. A uh, thing that changes the way that people see themselves and their civilization. Life of Brian says we need not, we, we needed not to believe in the founding generation were demigods in a literal sense, but it must be a virtual fact where we think to act as if they were. Yeah, again, the, there is a sense in which th there's a, a lot of people like to again deconstruct what we call the civic religion. And again, I know that terminology can be scary for some Christians, but understand what we're saying is there, there's a there's a mythology that is uh, critical to the understanding of every people, including the United States. This is, you know, this is where Jordan Peterson made such big inroads with people, you know, when he tried to explain to people like Sam Harris that there are things that might not be factually true, but are truer than any fact. and. This is also the the case when it comes to the the myths of founding, and so uh, while it it may be easy to go back and try to dismantle all of the founders, even for people who are reactionary and attempting to kind of dismantle some some of the more harmful uh, kind of modern uh, creations that conservatives have clung on to. Be careful with that universal asset uh, because it, it, it is important for certain understandings of those founders to remain intact. Uh, the, the, their continued truth is more important uh, than, uh, than whether or not a, a, a factual reality about very specific events happens to be the case. Let's see. Life of Brian says, snap out of it, Oren. Uh, you are true. You are good. You're a beautiful gosh darn it. People like you. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. Um, Cooper Weirdo says, Dante may have been great and uh, created great art, but he had a gay man in the inferno, so all the meaning and depth and power doesn't count. Yes, that is indeed how pretty much uh, everything goes. It, it doesn't matter if 
99% of this is much greater than anything ever. Uh, I did not say this thing that was hateful or racist in there. So therefore I am better than this person who did things I could never hope to do. The, the uh, converse of that, oh, right. Sorry, is that you see how truly terrible these people are at creating, yeah. right? Like just, just look at Netflix and you're like, okay, sure. I guess it's not racist quote unquote, but, uh, I'll I'll put it this way. I've been waiting for the transgender Dante and uh, have yet to see anything. And I'm not convinced I will. Is the, uh, there, there was some comedian, uh, and I forget he's got a lot of play. Um, uh, obviously it was a joke, but it's like, uh, is like, you know, they keep telling me that America was built on racism and, uh, now everything's falling apart and I'm starting to wonder where we can get some of that racism. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, very, very funny. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. Uh, Creeper Weirdo actually references Netflix here. I don't care what they told you in school. Cleopatra was black. Netflix current year. Yes, it's the Ptolemy dynasty is very hard for people to grasp. Well, um, here's the here's the best part, Creeper Weirdo. In current year, they tell you that in school too. So yeah. uh, Netflix and the public education system are in lockstep there. Yes. Did you know all of Africa looks exactly alike, and that is the not racist thing to believe? Yeah, really, yeah. right? All people are exactly the same else everywhere. Yes. They're truly an amazing moment. Uh, he also says, you guys uh, ever notice that any man uh, man that a white person could look up to has some weird fetish? It's almost like it's all made up. Karl Marx let his children starve to end uh, to the end. Fun fact. Well, let's <laughs> let's not talk about Rousseau, but yeah. Um, uh, Paladin uh, YYZ says, get ready for a shift uh, by your audience from your YouTube to Odyssey. Odyssey uh life they are like me uh, if they are like me okay just don't want google fiber kind of a uh, deal breaker uh, i'm not sure uh what you're saying there uh sorry paladin maybe it's difficult for you to watch on youtube and you're moving to odyssey my concern with odyssey is that they keep keep sending like they're going to go under at some point uh they're having a hard time i think uh staying afloat but i mean obviously i'm very glad that they exist and if you prefer to watch there by all means do of course you can always catch everything on blaze tv if you're worried about uh, in any interruptions on any of these platforms uh that's that's the best way to make sure that even if something is censored or pulled down uh it will always be up over at blaze tv for instance blaze tv is the only place that you can get my john oliver episode which was uh, uh which was illegitimately taken down uh by uh by youtube so uh Templar says the left is afraid uh, to deconstruct itself. Uh, yeah, that is, of course, a very interesting problem they are facing now. They're, they they are attempting to create their own founding myths, and they did to some extent, but now those are being eaten by the revolution, and the things that they're attempting to prop up in their place are simply, they, they have no moral force, and they, they aren't working. It's very clear, I think. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Like I said, please make sure to check out all of Jay Burden's work. He's doing excellent work over on his Substack and his YouTube channel. Of course, if this is your first time on this YouTube YouTube channel, make sure to subscribe. Make sure you turn on notifications. Click the bell if you want to catch these streams when they go live. If you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Aura McIntyre Show and your favorite broadcast or your favorite podcast platform when you do leave a rating or review it really helps with the algorithm magic and of course if you'd like to pre-order my book the total state you can go ahead and do that on amazon you can do it at barnes and nobles books a million anywhere that fine books are sold all right guys thank you for coming by and as always i will talk to you next time